Palisade Radio is brought to you by First Majestic Silver Corp., one of the world's purest and fastest growing silver mining companies. This is Colin Cattell with Palisade Radio, and we are back for another Sprott Monthly Market Update with none other than Rick Rule. Rick, thank you for coming back on the show. Colin, thanks for the opportunity. We enjoy it. I think we tend to focus these days more attention on the negatives of the bear market or reasons why this is the worst bear market, metrics that outline the historically low level of interest in the sector. But a bull market only starts when some positive things begin to occur in the background, maybe new funds raising capital to deploy, or even retail guys seeing value in a sector they have never invested in before. What positives come to mind today, Rick, that you see happening and most people are not focused on? Well, the easiest is simply the fact that the industry is well and truly in liquidation. Uh, an example would be uranium. If you sell the stuff for 35 bucks a pound and you make it for $60 a pound, losing 25 or $30 a pound and trying to make it up on volume, eventually that comes to a halt. If you continue to need uranium, then the price must go up because the industry has to eventually earn its cost of capital. The very depth of the bull market speaks something to the extent of the recovery. Because when demand re- begins to recover and supply has been destroyed, supply can't be restored in the near term to meet demand. And you get the type of spike hikes that people enjoyed in 2002, 2003, 2004. This is inevitable, but it may or may not be eminent. With regards to money circling the sector, money is not the issue, Colin. The industry wants dumb money, and it may take another year and a half to break the industry expectation with regards to dumb money. There is a lot of money around the sector, an awful lot of money around the sector. We have reasonable amounts of money, but you're seeing uh, sovereign wealth funds. You're seeing uh, Chinese peristatals. You're seeing all kinds of money attempting to get into the sector. It's good projects and good management teams that are scarce, not money. Okay, I want to talk about the effect of what one could call chronic indecision on the economy by Janet Yellen and the Fed. And the effect that that indecision has is maybe paralyzing people. I mean, a lot of a lot of investors would expect gold to move up or down substantially on some of these announcements by the Fed. And it just seems to continue on the traje- trajectory it's been with no major changes either way. Uh, what do you think about commodity prices with this indecision Janet Yellen's been pushing towards the market? I think the indecision is r- reflective of an indecision among America's academic, political, and economic elites. I think it was Mencken that once said that an election is an advanced auction of stolen property. And Ms. Yellen is the uh, recipient, if that's the right phrase, of an awful lot of, point of points of view. Wall Street's point of view, which says you can't raise the interest rate. Uh, Saver's points of view, that you have to raise the interest rate. Um, you know, I, I don't think that the indecision rests all with Ms. Yellen. And don't confuse me with a supporter of Ms. Yellen. I wish that whoever ran the Treasury had at least once upon a time had a job, which she has never had. But the truth is her indecision or the indecision that is, that is attributed to her is, in fact, indecision on the parts of a bunch of competing elites. Now, back to your question, my suspicion, and it's just a suspicion, I'm not an economist, is that the jobs number and, importantly, the wage growth number were sufficient to give them an excuse to raise the interest rate by a quarter point in December if they want to. And if they do that, and if they can make that interest rate rise stick, I suspect that you'll see a continuation of the strength in the U.S. dollar. And a continuation in the strength of the U.S. dollar would lead to a little bit of further weakness in the prices of everything denominated in dollars, of course, meaning natural resources, and in particular, precious metals. So my suspicion is over the next four weeks or so, the probability, and it's just a slight probability, but the probability is that precious metals prices in particular, head lower, not higher. You are not a general market analyst, as you've pointed out to me in the past, but something very concerning is happening in the general equities. And it's driven partially by the low interest rates and the fact that these companies uh, across the board are very strong. Uh, An example from today is Nike just announced uh, that they're going to be doing a stock split and purchasing a further $12 billion of their own stock back, despite the fact that they're at an all-time high and that's following a slight decline in their stock. Not important to focus on Nike, but 
what do you see as the consequences of these companies focusing so intently on their share price? It seems like that's the only driving force. Well, I think that's a very important point that you've made, Colin. The companies are in incredibly good financial shape, uh, and they're being encouraged to substitute cheap debt for equity, um, not least because of the uh, option incentive-based compensation that's in place. Nike is, and I, as you point out, not a general securities analyst, a truly stupendous company in terms of revenue growth, in terms of margin, and in terms of balance sheet strength. So it is possible for them to return money to shareholders. Certainly from a U.S. shareholder's point of view, returning capital to shareholders via a buyback rather than via a dividend, which is taxable, is tax efficient. The question becomes, however, whether the companies are taking capital out of the system that they need that they may need to expand when interest rate goes higher and their cost of capital, at least debt capital, will go higher. With regards to Nike, the likely answer is no, because their operating margins are so astonishing. Um, but the caveat to that, as you so wisely stated, Colin, is that I'm a natural resources analyst, not a broad-based securities analyst. All right, well, let's get back to natural resources then. And on our last monthly update, we discussed retail silver supply being in a crunch, which was driving the prices of rounds up against spot. Can you provide an update on silver supply as a whole? Uh, the situation with regards to retail tightness continues. The premiums that people are paying at retail are astonishing from my point of view. Uh, were I a retail silver buyer, I'd save up for a couple of months and I'd buy products in kilo bars or larger where there's no shortage and where the premium goes down. The shortage that's beginning to interest me, Colin, is that we're beginning to see supply destruction at the producer level in silver. Certainly recycling supplies are in pretty good shape, but in terms of new mine supplies, $14 silver is not a friend of the primary silver producer. And you're seeing sustaining capital investments, particularly in Mexico and Peru, being deferred on primary silver mines. That won't have an impact on supply for 12 months, but it'll have a real impact on supply and a real impact on production cost looking up 24 months. The second factor that I see that I think will begin to constrain new mine supply going forward, and this is a bit tricky, I'm going to ask your listeners to put on their accountant hats, but the truth is that there's beginning to be in both gold and silver production a substantial variance between mined grade and median reserve grade, which means that companies during periods of low prices are mining their better material first. Uh, that does two things. It um, means that they'll be mining material without sweeteners later, and it may sterilize some of the lower grade material that, remi that remains. This probably won't have an impact in 2016, but it could have a very interesting impact in 2017, 2018, very much like it had an impact on gold production and the cost of gold production in 2004, 5, and 6. The third thing that we need to talk about, and I'm sorry for this long-winded answer, Colin, is that these very low copper prices, lead prices, and zinc prices are beginning to lead to substantial uh, reductions in sustaining capital investments in base metal mines. And the largest product, product, production of silver that we enjoy worldwide is as a byproduct of producing primary materials like copper, lead, zinc, and gold first. As the sustaining capital investments in those primary metals goes down, the byproduct silver production will certainly go down. As I say, this isn't anything that your silver bugs can look forward to in 2016, but it will exacerbate a price response at some point in time in the future. One of my favorite questions I ask a lot, is the bottom in for silver and gold, Rick? I don't believe so. Uh, I don't believe so. We have very widespread confidence in the hegemony of the U.S. dollar and the hegemony of the U.S. 10-year treasury. Um, for, for my own point of view, I can't tell you when the bottom is going to be in, and I certainly believe, if you look five years out, that you and I as purchasers will look back to 2015, 2016 as being the good old days. But I see no wavering of strength on a global basis in the acceptance of the hegemony, either of the U.S. dollar or the benchmark uh, security, which is the U.S. 10-year treasury. And until you see real dollar weakness 
And until you see weakness in the 10-year treasury, I don't think that you're going to see prolonged strength in the precious metals business. I think you're going to see it, but I don't think you're going to see it immediately. And by the way, Colin, I said this on your show before, but I think it's important for your listeners to understand. I don't think that gold and silver are going to win the war against the U.S. dollar. But I think they're going to lose it a lot less badly, the same way they did the beginning of the last decade, which will feel like a win to all of us. Rick, can you name your favorite commodity outside of the precious metal space? I know last year you had talked about uranium, but there's a lot of uncertainty to how long the uranium price can stay down. Is there anything else on your mind, specific commodity? Well, in my own portfolio, I mean, to answer the question directly, but in a way that's not useful to many of your listeners, uh, certainly water in the U.S. and Southwest. I've been a water investor directly for 25 years. And the performance of my own water portfolio, not just this year, but going back a decade, has been spectacular. Most people don't have the ability to play the water game. And certainly the water game has become um, much more expensive. But really, I'm attracted to a whole range of commodities where ongoing demand for the commodity is certain and where the selling price for the commodity is less than the cost of production. That is to say, industries where there's ongoing demand for the product, but the industry itself is in cannibalization and liquidation. And there are numbers of those. We talked about uranium. We've talked in the past about platinum and palladium. Certainly, we will reach a point uh, by the third quarter of 2016 where oil and gas equities will, be cut, will begin to become increasingly attractive. The truth is, Colin, at some point in time, and I can't tell you when, it could be as long as two, weeks, two years from now, we are going to recover from an absolutely epic bear market. And the consequence of that is going to be an absolutely manic bull market. It's difficult for people to understand that day follows night. But one of the advantages of being my age relative to being your age is that you know that in some way, shape, or form, past is prologue. Let us conclude with a piece on Paris, obviously a very eerily similar situation to what we had in September of 2001 in the U.S. and somewhat Canada. Um, what's baffled a lot of precious metals investors is why the gold price did not spike up on what you could call a political turmoil situation. It certainly has in the past. And I think it's all about confidence. I think when people look for safe haven assets right now, they look for assets that have performed in the last 10 years, which is to say they look for the U.S. 10-year treasury and they look for gold. Uh, pardon me, for, uh, for U.S. dollars. I think the U.S. dollar is the default asset on a global basis. I don't think it's going to continue to be. I think that the arithmetic surrounding the U.S. dollar, as we've described before, will eventually mitigate and that gold will come to be seen in a much more positive light. But for right now, confidence in the dollar is high. When people disintermediate out of the euro, they don't disintermediate to gold. They, in fact, disintermediate to the U.S. 10-year treasury. Another interesting question is the fact that with all the turmoil in the Middle East, that the price of oil hasn't gone up. When oil used to respond to um, political challenges, it was a consequence of the fact that supply and demand were much more closer to balance. The truth is, despite the increases in U.S. production, oil production isn't up much. But oil demand on a global basis is very soft. And with the plurality of supply over demand, people are less afraid of political disruption in the Middle East than they once were. The consequence of that is that people who want to express an investment preference by way of fear go to the U.S. 10-year treasury. And the greed excuse for buying oil is obviated given the very tepid worldwide demand for the stuff as feedstock. You know what? I'm going to ask you one last question that just popped in my mind, and this is a question that can only be answered from someone with experience. It seems to me and a lot of people I've talked to that now that we're four and a half years into this bear market, the feeling that there's no way that this bull market is going to resume gets stronger and stronger. There seems to be less catalyst. You start to doubt your theories. Does this happen to you? Does it happen to you every time? And um, how, do you, how do you work against that feeling if it is? One of the, maybe the only real advantage of growing old, other than that you didn't die, uh, is that you realize some basic truths. Uh, the truth is that we live in an oil-centric world. And an economic structure where oil is priced below the total cost of production means either that the oil price goes up or we stop driving. I know how that question gets answered. 
uh, a, a world where one of the basic components of electrical generation, uranium is priced below the price, uh, the cost of production, means either that the price of uranium goes up or the lights go out. And I also know from experience how that resolves itself. You could say the same thing with, re with regards to copper and the same thing with regards to agricultural minerals. Of course, if you've worked as long as I have, people begin to regard you as a guru and they don't want you to ask the what question, they want you to answer the when question. But as I responded to you last month, I'm too old and wise to get sucked into that trap. Okay, Rick, thank you so much. Always a pleasure. We'll have you back on next month. My pleasure, Colin. Thank you. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen? Are you too stupid? <laughs>